right, so now that we got those out of our hands, um, let's call Mr. Arjun Kumar to the stage to talk and introduce our next guest speaker. Stay tuned, guys. That's me. Or Vidhi. My bad. That'll be Vidhi, our director of activities. Come on up, Vidhi. Check here, Vidhi. Uh, hi everyone again. So our next speaker, uh, well, he is actually very talented in my eyes. He okay. found himself writing software and creating games for early computers. He got his dream job as a senior director of technical evangelism at Microsoft, where he spent uh, 11 and a half years working. He left that and founded Juicy Bits, which is a company which designs apps for phones. And his apps are so well known that he was actually named in Apple's Editor's Choice, a Starbucks app pick of the week, and called by Apple as one of the best apps of the year. And apart from that, this is really interesting, he uh, coordinated a Donkey Kong world record breaking attempt with Guineas and New Line Cinema, as well as worked on a reality TV show. So without further ado, please welcome on stage Mr. Mike Swanson. Does he not want the mic? Does he not want the mic? Hey, that worked, all right. Thank you for that introduction, and thank you uh, to everyone for coming out. I'm, I'm so impressed by this conference. Aren't these guys doing an amazing job? I mean, it's Talk. Am I talking? I can be a loud guy, so I have to be careful. <clears throat> I can either have my evening voice or my real loud voice. Um, they asked me to talk a little bit about my background, what Juicy Bits is, which is actually the funny name of my company. Uh, a little bit about innovation, of course, since that's the theme of the conference, and we've heard a bunch about that today. And then kind of what success means. And along the way, I'll pepper it with little insights that I've kind of gleaned in my gray years, uh, and we'll see where we go from there. So this is me when I was really young. I lived at the computer, I breathed at the computer. If anyone ever wondered where Mike was, the answer was he was at the computer all the time. You can find me there, even today you can find me there pretty much all the time. I'm looking at my wife right now. I was very curious, I love what Te uh, Kevin was talking about earlier, which is passionate, curious, you hear these terms over and over today, and I can't stress how important those things are. I was a curious little guy, I love to take things apart. I took that computer apart many times, believe me. Um, but I had a curiosity when I was young that I like to talk about, and that is, how much is a million? You know, it's maybe not as much today as it was then, but the number one million, how much is that really? I know how many zeros to put behind it, but what does it mean? And I was curious one day, what does a million mean? So I took a calculator, this is what they looked like back in those days, this is the one that I used. Um, and on this calculator, you can put plus, plus one, and then every time you hit that little EXE button, the equal button essentially, you go up by one. So the idea was, I'll just press this button until it says a million. <laughs> so I did this eight hours a day. This became a little bit of a project. Matter of fact, everybody in high school was checking in. The school newspaper ended up writing a little report on this. I thought it'd be done pretty soon. I could do about 10,000 presses of that key per hour, which ends up to be about three per second. And I actually ended up with this little twitch in my finger. So when I'd walk between classes, I could actually continue going. So does anybody have any idea how long it takes? Now I just did this doing school hours. I obviously didn't do it in the evening. I'd put my calculator in the locker and I'd pick it up again in the morning. It takes a long time. It took me 12 solid school days from when I arrived early to when I left at the end of the day to press that button one million times. I don't know what I really learned from that other than when I hear a million nowadays, I know what that means. That's a lot. Imagine paying somebody a dollar three times a second for 12 days, eight hours straight. A lot. Here's a quote from Albert Einstein, and I've got a few favorite quotes as I go through here. He says, I have no special talents. I am only passionately curious. Turns out, by accident, the word passion and the word curious, two words that we've used a lot today, are in that very one quote. So I'm going to fast forward a bit and talk about my time at Microsoft. We've got a bunch of Microsofties here today. I was there for uh, almost 12 years. I was a senior director. Um, but I want to talk about getting hired because this is another example of what I would call something that's creative. So when I wanted to get hired by Microsoft initially, this was back in 1998, Microsoft received 13,520 resumes every month. And if you do the math, that's around 450 resumes per day. So I said, well, wow, 
I'm going to send my resume in, and it's just going to go in this big mountain. And no one's going to recognize it, no one's going to see it. How do you stand out? What can I do that's creative here? So this is a, I can't believe I'm putting this up here, an embarrassing picture of me holding an old Microsoft keyboard. And if you've ever seen those little cardboard stand-ups, like you know you can buy Chewbacca and those guys, I actually made a cardboard stand-up of myself that was just as high as me. And I went down to FedEx, and this was the largest thing they would ship, by the way. If I was another inch, they wouldn't have been able to ship it. But I said, you know what, if I made something that big, with my resume included, of course, and I FedExed it to HR at Microsoft, and I lived in Michigan, Michigan at the time, someone's got to notice that. I and mean, how crazy is that? So I sent it off. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. I sent it off, didn't hear anything. I was kind of disappointed because it took me a lot of work to do that. I figured it was a loss. So. It was about six months later, I get this email from the Vice President of Human Resources at Microsoft, Mike Murray at the time, and he says, uh, your life-size cutout is prominently displayed in the hallway outside my office door. It has become a great topic of conversation. And there's some other stuff in there about good luck with your job. It didn't get me a job, but it got me noticed. And the one thing I learned here is when you're in a big group and everything, everybody looks the same, everything looks the same, which one of those things do you notice? You notice the one that stands out, the one that is different the one that is unique. If you can make yourself unique, no matter what you're doing, I say that's an advantage. So my wife and I moved to Seattle in 2005, low down here, and I got this weird role in technical evangelism. Explains why I like talking into microphones, doesn't it? And to explain it really easily is, if we're gonna release a product where that line is, evangelism is getting people excited about it before it ships, and marketing it is what happens after it ships. A very simplified view of the world there, but that helps understand it. In particular, I was responsible for events, so this is near and dear to my heart. We would do a little bit bigger events at the Los Angeles Convention Center. And just because people like to see these shots, this is a ballroom um, actually in Las Vegas here, and we're converting it over into a keynote, which takes about two days. Here's what it looks like behind the screen. If you actually walk behind the screens of one of these keynotes, it looks like a little city. And I was responsible for all this stuff. There we are looking actually at the back of those screens, so the audience is on the other side of those screens. There I am actually talking myself away up in a keynote. But we got to partner with a lot of good companies like NASA. We got to play with their rover a little bit, at least the duplicate of their rover. Fun brands like Cirque du Soleil. We got to make Connect powered Lazy Boy recliners. How crazy is that? Worked with the Discovery Channel on some custom cars. You guys might have heard about this or seen this. This is outside the Microsoft store, right? Belly Square, as a matter of fact. I see a hand that went up there. So why would you leave a company like that? Right, been at Microsoft for about 12 years. Why the heck would I? Here's some uh, progression kind of all the way through to the final instruction screen that you'd see in the app if you launched it. Here's an example of some work that's done related to the icon. So a bunch of different iterations and ideas before you finally end up at the one that you think looks good in the lower right. Another app is called Layout, which lets you lay out your photos on a page. It launched also at an, as an editor's choice. I was very fortunate. And then the most recent one, it's called Halftone 2. It's a follow-up to the one that everyone uh, seems to love. And it allows you, this is actually it running on an iPad. Um, and you can make comic books and load your photos in and make people look silly. This is what it looks like when you, when you actually go into the app. And it also launched as an editor's choice. So I want to talk a little bit about innovation as it relates to what I do. Now, I don't go to Africa. I was floored by that story earlier. I don't do DNA extraction. I don't do particle physics, although I'm fascinated in all those things, to be honest with you. But innovation, at least in software, for me, I actually, we've talked a bunch about the definition today. I actually looked it up. Number one, to do something in a new way. Seems consistent with what we've heard today. And number two, to have new ideas about how something can be done. So there's that incremental innovation that we actually heard Kevin talk a little bit about. So here's one of my favorite puzzles. You may have seen this puzzle. I'm not going to unfortunately be able to give you much time to solve it. But the idea is, can you put your pencil down and with four straight lines, and not lifting your pencil by the way, with four straight lines, can you go through all those dots? So if you look at that and you think about it, you're probably going to be one dot short, unless you've seen this puzzle before. And I'm going to give you the answer unfortunately, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So here we go. Here's the classic answer. You put it down and you go outside the dots and come back, which allows you to actually accomplish this puzzle. And while we've talked about thinking outside the box, this is literally thinking outside the box. Here's another creative solution. I can do it in three, somebody said. I put, the, put this on my blog uh, years ago and somebody said, well, I can do it in three. And sure enough, they could do it in three. Probably my favorite one, give me a fat enough pencil and I can do it in one, Mike. <laughs> and then the best one of all, I thought that actually was the best one of all. But here's where you learn to challenge assumptions. 
Don't just assume things. It's amazing how often when we assume things we end up being wrong. Somebody said, you never told me I had to keep all the dots in the pattern that they were in. I'm going to put them in a row and do it in one. I give them bonus points for thinking outside the box. So this one you've got to watch closely. This is challenging assumptions again. See square A and square B there. You can probably all see them from where you are. No trickery here. Looks like square A is darker than square B, doesn't it? But watch it move. It's literally the same color. You would assume that the one up in the top was darker than the one that's actually in shadow because of the way your optics work and the way your brain per perceives. So here's James Dyson, the inventor of that great vacuum. If you want to discover something that other people haven't discovered, you need to do things the wrong way. You need to mess up a little bit. It's okay to mess up. Matter of fact, you should mess up as much as you can. Just make sure that you don't repeat the same mistake twice. So one of the innovations I had in uh, my Halftone 2 app here, if you look at this boom up here, one of these little stamps, you know, boom, bam, wham, pow, all those kinds of things. Uh, it turns out on the iPhones in particular, there was no way to actually draw high quality graphics. So here's two little dots, and you've probably seen this before. They look about the same, but when I zoom that one in, see how jagged it is? Maybe you can't see it, but trust me, it's got a lot of jaggies in it. This one, when it scales up, though, is nice and smooth. Turns out that's because of a guy named Pierre Bézier, who used to work for Renault, the car company, uh, back in 1962, formalized this equation that allows him to draw nice, smooth curves. Matter of fact, all the fonts on your computer, everything you type, if you've ever drawn a curve on a computer, Pierre Bézier is probably behind all that. An interesting side note, if you've seen this over the last day, and if you haven't, you will see it over the next day, probably, Jean-Claude Van Damme, uh, riding these Volvo trucks, turns out there is a connection here, and that is that uh, Volvo actually bought Renault trucks uh, many years ago, back in 2001. I just had to connect that somehow, because this is a really cool ad. So here's what uh, a shape in Halftone 2 looks like with all these control points and curves, and there's a lot of math behind it. Uh, and the idea to draw these at a high quality was something that I had to kind of innovate with on the platform. Number two, here's the, the do you guess, is it WASA? Yes. At home I was saying WSSA, but I've heard WASA so much I'll say WASA. Here's the WASA logo, and in most graphics apps you know you can grab these little handles on the side and you can rotate them with your mouse. You've probably all done something like this somewhere. See, exactly. So, if you think of a touch device, it doesn't even have to be an iPad, any touch device you have. The beauty of a touch device is that it's changed the way we interact with computers. Instead of a mouse, which is removed, and a little pointer that points, it's our finger. And the idea is that I'm actually moving the thing under the glass. It's millimeters away from me. Between the glass and me is the thing. Which requires computer scientists to think about how we do those interactions. Sure, I could, there's a lot of graphics apps where these handles are still there because they haven't even bothered to rethink how I might interact with these elements when I'm now on a touchscreen device. Well, I thought it through. So I threw, a, threw a, a little Juicy Bits business card down on the desk and said, well, that's an object. Here's my finger. How am I going to do things with it? How are you going to move it? Well, guess what? Your instinct is you touch the middle of it and you can slide it all over the table. You all will nod right now and you understand how that works. Well, what if you wanted to spin it or rotate it? <clears throat> well, you're going to touch the edge. You might also touch the middle to keep it still, but that's how you'd want to do that. So I said, you know what, that's how I'm going to do that. <clears throat> and I believe this is one of the reasons that Apple picked it as one of their editor's choices. That's how you work with graphics inside of Halftone. So if you combine the two of those things, so we look at this boom element up here. It starts out in the, you know, somebody draws it. I actually have a comic company that draws them, so there's the boom. There's what it looks like with all the curves and control points, the mathematics behind it. It gets scaled down into a much smaller, blockier version, because now we need to figure out where, where does a finger, when I touch this thing, where is it touching it? Right? I need to know. It's blurred, turned into a, a very rough bitmap, and this is scaled back up then so that when you touch this element, anything that's black means you're touching that element. And if you're going to touch it inside the circle, well, when you move your finger, we're just going to move it on the screen for you. And if you touch it anywhere outside, it's going to move it around and scale it. That's a small innovation. It's nothing along the lines of some of the other things we've seen. So what does success look like or some of the things I've thought about? <clears throat> Here's a question. This is a company most of you know. Founded in 2003, made 51 games, most of which you've never heard of. And in December 2009, nearly went bankrupt. Anyone have a guess? Not Cranium. Good guess, though. Yes? Not Atari. All right, here we go. Angry Birds, Rovio. Everyone thinks 
Angry Birds was an overnight success. How many of you have heard the story of the two guys who started Rovio and you know, last year they made 195 plus million? Sounds just like an overnight success story. Well, if you actually look at the story, it's not an overnight success story. Turns out, most overnight success stories aren't overnight success stories. James Dyson, our buddy earlier, invented this wonderful vacuum. 5,126 failed prototypes before he finally built this one. Remember that advice about screwing up many times? Get back on that horse and try again. Success consists of going from failure to failure without a loss of enthusiasm. I love that quote. You just get back up and you do it again. Another little tidbit. WD-40 stands for water displacement 40th attempt. Literally. <laughs> Literally that's what that means. Go to WD-40 site and that's actually what they'll tell you. So I'll connect it a little bit to what I've done. I was, uh, or Halftone was a Starbucks pick of the week. These little cards you can pick up in Starbucks. And to a lot of people that I've talked to or asked me about this, they think that it just magically happened. And kind of like the stories I've been telling you, it didn't magically happen. It took over a year of my work to reach out to find the right person, reach out to the right person, don't annoy the right person, make sure they're aware of what you're doing, blah, 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 blah. Turns out there is no official submission process for this, so you have to figure out a creative way to make it happen. And I don't have time to go into all the details about how it happened, but it did happen, and I'm here to tell you it was not an overnight success. So a couple parting thoughts. You gotta love what you do. You absolutely have to love what you do. One of the things I love hearing today is the word passion. And as a former Microsofty, it's a word we used a lot there and I will continue to use it. Passion is very important. If you love what you do, I can almost step back and know that you're gonna do that thing. You've heard the phrase, the ball is in someone else's court. I'm here to tell you that you should throw away that phrase or at least modify it with a little mic advice. The ball is never in someone else's court. At least it's not in that court for long. If it's sitting on the other side of the net and nothing's happening, my advice is to jump that net, go get that ball, and do something. I couldn't find a really great picture for this one, but this is help your future self. Another mic advice. Picture yourself as your best buddy, your best friend, your best coworker. Somebody you depend on every single day. You love this person. Matter of fact, you sleep with this person every night. It's you. Think of yourself as your best friend and imagine yourself a little bit into the future. And I'll give you a good example, a very easy example of this that some of you may already do. If you know you're gonna go somewhere and you're gonna leave and you might forget your keys or your coat, right, you're somewhere you don't know. Guess what you can do? You can put your keys right there and you're gonna walk over them on the way out the door. You won't forget them because you're gonna trip on them. That's an example of you helping your future self. You're gonna put those keys there knowing that later on you're gonna trip over them. You've made your future life easier. Kinda of like your own little butler. The last one I think I have here is never say no on behalf of someone else. A lot of the crazy stuff I've done in my life is really boiled down to picking up a phone or sending an email and asking a question. While it took a long time for the Starbucks, that's basically what I did. It was a lot of asking the question. It was failing and getting up and trying again and just doing it relentlessly. Never say no on someone else's behalf. Always ask. You'll be surprised how often somebody is willing to lend you a hand and help you out. This just backs up what we heard earlier. I did look up the average starting salary for the class of 2013 in engineering and computer science, and this includes more than what Kevin showed, which is why the numbers are a little lower, but they're still the two highest categories. It is definitely a field to go into. And since I love you guys so much, I do have a bunch of promo codes for Halftone too. So if you do have an iPhone or an iPad and you want a free copy of that little comic app, come find me at some point here and I'll just give you a code and you can go into the app store, click redeem, type the code in and you'll get a free copy of it. And with that, I'll thank you. Yeah, sure. Anybody have any questions? I'm happy to answer questions. You know I love to talk. <laughs> yes. So in developing the app, how successful were you in trying to find people? You mentioned that you had, for example, a comic company that drew elements in the app. How was that process? So a couple interesting tangents there. One was uh, Marvel Comics, of all places, reached out and had some conversations about using some of the technology. That ended up not going anywhere from, from more, more of my choice than theirs. But you put something good out there and the right people will find it, in general, I've found. Um, the second one, you book, send them to me in a digital format, and then I run them through some tools that I've built that converts it into something that can, can do what I showed you up on the screen. 
Good question. Other questions? Yeah, way in the back. Yeah, good question. The question was, um, how do you decide what you're going to pursue or what your next idea is? So I have a file. This works for me. I've got a file on my desktop, my computer, and I run Macs and PCs. This one happens to be on my PC. It's called ideas.docx. And whenever I have an idea, if I've just driven home or something like that, I'll double click that file. I'll write the name of it, the shortest of descriptions about what this app idea is, and I'll just put it away. Because as a one-man shop by design, you, know, you don't have a lot of time in your day to think about these kinds of things. So when there does come a lull, when I need to think about, well, what am I going to do next? I'll open that file up, and it's, very, it's amazing how fast after a little time has gone by, you can just strike, oh, that was a, what was I thinking that day? Gone. Right? You can strike a lot of these ideas because they're bad ideas, uh, and, the, and you've had the benefit of time to think them through. Some other choices for me, since I, by design, I'm a one-person op, one operation and that's just the way I want it to be, um, that makes decisions for me. So there's a lot of apps that would require a lot more work than I, as one person, can, can provide and still maintain the apps that I already have. So a lot of the more complicated apps, uh, I just have to say no to because there's no way for me to do it. Um, and there's some other factors involved as well. The one other factor is if there's services that my app depends on, and you guys probably use a lot of apps like this, like Facebook would be an example. When you're using Facebook, if Facebook is down, you're not going to use Facebook very well. So Facebook has to maintain you know, their services. So I've, in particular, I've chosen apps that don't require me to maintain a, a service like that, so I don't have to worry 24-7 whether that service is up and running. All my apps are very simple uh, apps that, you know, even if the comic app didn't run, I don't think you're going to, no one's going to die, no one's going to get hurt, so uh, that helps too. Good question. Any other questions? And there we go. Thank you, guys. All right, thank you, Mr. Swanson. Uh, I've heard him speak once more, uh, one time before, and it was great having him again. Uh, just a little thank you gift. I know your wife's here, so a little awkward, but yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>